Hello and welcome everyone. Richard Schneeman here talking about testing. So uh, we did some testing in the last exercises where I wrote the tests and then you all went and you, you solved them. Um, so it was kind of the first introduction in this class into testing and maybe you had the question of why test. Why, why write tests? What are tests good for? Um, so anytime I'm coding a application, I want to uh, stay away from any preventable disasters. Um, you know, if, uh, if a piece of the application is critical to me, then I will test it. So um, let's say, for example, that um, your website is really great and everybody loves it. You're getting hundreds of users and um, everybody's telling it, uh, giving it out to their friends and their friends' friends, and then, you know, everybody loves all of your features, and you're like, oh, man, this website would be even better if we had another feature. So you add, you add that new feature, and that new feature breaks an old feature, but everybody loves the old feature. So they come to your website, and, uh, you know, then you're, you're going to ask yourself, so you deploy that, did you, did you manually test all of your features? Do you know that everything is going to be working? You know, if you didn't, then your users might end up seeing an error page or no page at all, uh, and then you're going to scramble to fix it. And you know, we've got, uh, you know, that that was a preventable disaster. So, um, you know, if if maybe uh, Amazon EC2 entirely goes down, or or whoever you're you're hosting on, or like the uh, electricity in the entire world goes down, of course your website's going to go down. Uh, but there are some things that are a little bit out of your control. In terms of application programming mistakes, then those are completely inside of your control and, like I said, preventable disasters. So, in general, I'd say only test the features that you want to work, which is a little bit, uh, bit tongue-in-cheek there, but um, I wanted to introduce the concept of manual testing versus automated testing. So, uh, before we begin, if anybody out there is listening and you're already very familiar with testing, um, just so you know, it's a very almost uh, it's a very revered, almost religious in nature topic among programmers. Uh, so take everything I say with a grain of salt. Um, you know, definitely not uh, n not the gospel, but this is just how I view things and how I how I like working. So uh, let's start off with manual testing first. So uh, manual testing is you're building your app, you make a change, you re refresh the change, and you see if that did what you thought. So um, it's really the, the benefits of this. It's very simple. It's very understandable. Obviously, you're going to go through and you are going to be, um, you know, as you're coding, you're going to be making those changes. You're going to be you know, iterating. You're going to be verifying that those changes work and using this method you get immediate feedback you know hopefully this is something similar to what we've been doing as you've been doing the exercises and i've, I've kind of been coaching you along those ways of, of taking a very tiny step and measuring taking a step back maybe we check the logs maybe we do a put statement um just in your head you're almost making this this mental assertion you're saying when i click this button i assert that i will see a new user i assert i will see this different page um, so, you know, it, again, it's, it's, it makes sense. It's a very common sense thing to do. So some cons, it's very time consuming. Every single time you make a change, sure, it, it's really easy to test the current feature you're working on. But, uh, in the example we went over previously, mm, the current feature I was working on broke a previous feature. So unless you are going to test every single feature you have on your website every single time you launch, um, you know, that that would be incredibly time consuming. It'd also be difficult to scale uh, and prone to mistakes, you know. It'd be really easy to have an error that you, maybe you already know how to avoid it. You know the conditions in, under which that error might happen. So as a developer, you will stay away from those. You will not uh, induce those those error states, but your users don't. You know, your users are not developers. So again, I, I, the biggest one here, it's yes, it's it's very time consuming to actually go through and test all of these these features over and over and over again, and it's also um, easy to introduce mistakes. So we've already been doing manual testing, but 
uh, we haven't done any automated testing yet. And you might ask, okay, well, you know, hey, what what is this? Uh, what is this automated testing thing? Um, so with automate, automated testing, we are going to write code that makes assertions about your code. And I guess we did see this in the exercise, and, and you got the experience of making some tests pass, um, but uh, you didn't get the experience of actually writing the code. So just in general, we're going to run the assertion code and see if everything passes. If it does, we're good to go. If not, we have to look and see what exactly caused those failures. Uh, so the pros of automated testing, it's going to be consistent. Every single time you run your test, if you if, if it's a well-written test, then it, you will have consistent results. Basically, if it fails once, it should fail every time until you make code changes. If it passes once, it will pass every time until you make code changes. Uh, individually, those tests are much quicker to run. It is a lot, a lot easier to run a suite where you just say, go, test my code, and it, you know, it runs all the different tests than it is for you to say, I'm going to go to the web page, I'm going to click this button, and I'm going to look, and I'm going to see if I see the results I should. Um, it's also scalable, meaning that if your coworker writes a test and then pushes to the repository, and then uh, you write a test and push it to the repository, you know, everybody gets the benefits of those tests. You don't have to walk around and say, okay, well, you know, it, it, first we're going to test this, and first we're going to... Um, you have to look for these elements and oh, watch out for that. Uh, so we're going to run these. They're going to be very repeatable. The cons of automated testing is it takes much longer to do this the first time. And some people will argue me tooth and nail over this line. Um, and that's fine. Uh, some people can um, can write tests incredibly, incredibly quickly. But in general... Um, you know, going and actually manually testing and manually validating what you think should be happening and what is actually happening on your app is going to be probably quicker than writing code that checks that for you the first time. Uh, so in addition to that, we have no immediate feedback. Uh, you have to write these assertions, and as you'll find as we get into this, that writing assertions is not the easiest thing in the world. Um... It might be possible that we every all of our tests pass, but we still have an error in our website, or the or vice versa. Some of our tests are failing, yet nothing is wrong. Uh, so it it is a little bit of a learned skill, and it will take a little bit of time um, to get to get used to that. Or some people just say plain say it's hard to test. Uh, I don't think that is entirely true. It's just another skill. Uh, knowing how to program as a skill and knowing how to how to test is a skill that are very intertwined and very related. But just because you're a good programmer does not automatically make you a good tester or vice. Well, probably if you're a good tester, you're probably a good programmer. All right. So uh, you know, hopefully you, you followed along with all of that. Um, in in general, though, I think that these pros and cons outweigh the value. The, the pros and cons of manual testing. I, I do both. I you know I test features as I'm building them. I also write um, automated tests. So you might ask, well, okay, sounds good. I'm I'm interested. I want to know more. Let's uh, let's talk a little bit more about automated testing. Uh, so just a note: we've talked about uh, two different environments that Rails comes with so far: uh, production and development. So Rails also comes with a test environment. And I take this to mean that Rails really wants you to test. You know, not, not only do they have the ability to test, but they have gone out of their way to say that, hey, listen, you can develop things in development. You, that's probably important. You can run things in production. That's probably, you know, that's as equally as important as, as developing your app is running in production. And you should probably test your code to, to make sure that uh, those features you wrote are, are still working like you thought they would. And, um, you know, that's really, really, really important, so much so that we added an entire environment to it. So I, Rails kind of encourages you to, uh, to test. Also, before I go too deep into this, I did mention this previously, but uh, just to reiterate, uh, testing can be kind of a religious topic for some programmers. Um, so certainly not everyone is going to agree with everything I say, and I probably wouldn't agree with everything that they say. The, at the end of the day, though, the important part is that you're, we're writing um, maintainable code that doesn't break for our users. So let's, uh, let's keep on going.
there are a couple of different type of automated uh, tests that, or test suites that we can use. We can use uh, unit tests, and um, these are going to focus on uh, classes and methods. This is kind of the smallest, lowest um, increment of a test that we can run. Uh, we can write functional tests, and those are going to be focused on controllers. We can also write integration tests, and which are actually personally my favorite. Lots of people say, oh man, they're so slow, but um, with integration tests, you're testing everything. You're testing your full stack. You are, you are hitting your controllers and your views and your models and your routes, and uh, really you are looking at it like a user would look at it. And it because of that, it does take a little bit of extra time to run, a little bit extra time to write, but one test can exercise so many uh, many code paths, so many different uh, scenarios in your application. Um, I, I think we can be a little lighter weight with some of the other types of testing. And, you know, also we don't need to integration test everything. Um, if if we mix and match and, and we unit test the uh, some things and, and integration test other things, um, you know we can get to a pretty good uh, pretty good place. Uh, in general, I try to stick uh, with, with regards to integration testing. I stick to integration testing the things that are most important to my app. Um, well, I make sure to integration test the things that are most important to my app. So, uh, how do we actually write these tests? There are a couple of different popular testing frameworks that we can use. Uh, we can use Test Unit, which uh, ships out with Ruby, and it, it's available um, in 1.8 as well as 1.9. We can just require test slash unit, and then we make a class, and we inherit from Test Unit test case, and then we make uh, different methods. The methods start with test and they have to be unique. So whenever we run this, it's going to run each of the methods and inside of that method we have to have some sort of an assertion. So we can assert equal, we can just assert true or false. At the end of the day, uh, we just need uh, need those assertions. So maybe you've written some test unit cases, maybe maybe you've seen them previously. Um, introduce in 1.9, um, we have mini test. So uh, we can use mini test spec, which is, I love the syntax. Um, here we are just requiring mini test slash spec, and then we can say, hey, let's describe a meme. And then from, uh, from there, we can go in and actually write these, uh, you know, almost English sentences. So a meme, when asked about cheeseburgers, should respond positively. And inside of our code, we're actually saying meme.new.icann has cheeseburger dot must equal oh hi. So um, you you can also use the assertion syntax with this. You can just like we had previously assert equal. Um, but I do like the description ability, the the ability to nest these contexts. And instead of having to say um, test underscore uh, meme underscore uh, uh, should underscore say underscore um, we can just say when asked about cheeseburgers should respond positively that uh, and it's very natural I like it a lot um, RSpec lots of people use RSpec I heavily enjoy it and this was around um, before uh, mini test and definitely inspired mini test spec again we have a very very similar type of syntax we can say uh, describe so we're going to describe the role and here we're going to be describing validations and the presence validation and it's going to prevent roles from no user with no user from saving so um, we can go through um, RSpec also has a should this kind of matcher syntax so a should space be underscore false so we're saying instead of that would be similar to saying assert equal um, role dot valid comma false um, if you're just getting started, I find that these types of naming conventions for assertions actually do help quite a bit, but as you continue on programming, you'll find uh, it doesn't really matter. You, you become accustomed to um, the logic of writing assertions, so how you get there doesn't matter so much. Uh, there's also Cucumber, which has gained quite a bit of popularity. Um, it actually started out as RSpec Stories. And these are going to be natural language tests. So you're going to write them in pure English. So this is kind of taking that that spec style uh, description to a whole nother level. 
So um, you would say we've got a scenario of regular numbers, and I have entered two into the calculator. I've entered, or I've entered three in the calculator. I've entered two into the calculator. I press divide. The result should be 1.5 on the screen. So um, I don't. I'm not in love with this. Some people really, really, really enjoy cucumber. Um, I at the end of the day, your this has to be translated into code. We have to parse out that number three, that number two. We have to parse out divide and we have to parse out you know 1.5 and should and and all these different things you know maybe even calculator and screen and so that means we actually instead of normally we'd write our test and then we write some code and here we have to write our test and then we write some code that interprets our test and then we write our code so it's just an, an extra step um, i would just prefer to write my tests in uh, in ruby because that's what i'm testing i'm testing ruby so i write ruby um, I've seen quite a number of cases where people have huge cucumber, these are called features, and they are just massive run-on sentences, like 20 lines long, and um, it, it, it's really easy to kind of go overboard with. So anyway, I, again, I'm not a huge fan, but feel free to uh, uh, you know try it out if you want, and that is purely my opinion, that's just a little bit of advice. So, I, as I mentioned, I like to write my tests with code, and um, eh, I don't love Cucumber. Maybe, maybe I like it. Maybe it's, maybe it's okay. Maybe it's not so bad. I don't know. Anyway, uh, what I do like is testing critical pieces of my code as a user would use them. Makes sense. If we're going to be manually testing, we would load up a page, and we'd click a button, and we would verify that, you know, yes, I am logged in. Um, I love uh, being able to do that, and so I like writing integration tests that can do that uh, for us. So, um, in general, in in most of the applications I'm working in, sign up is very critical. Uh, when I worked for Gowalla, we we're a social network, so our our you know we're kind of measured by our user numbers, and if there's something wrong with sign up, then well, you're going to get less users signing up. Um, so similarly, sign in very important, and if if it goes down, people can't sign in. People can't actually use your application. Well, it's not very useful then. If uh, you know if Facebook was still up, but the sign-in was down and everybody was logged out, well, nothing would happen. But, uh, you know, let's try to avoid that. Uh, so, as I'm going through, I I kind of pick these you know big pain points where if you know if this feature w was not working, um, that would be as bad as my entire application being down. Um, and I make extra sure to uh, to test those features or to test those components. But how, you might ask. In the past, I've really, really enjoyed using RSpec and, as we talked about previously, as well as a tool called Capybara. And Capybara is going to simulate a... Um, a browser type experience so we can we can tell our test we can we can say open up a web page and you know visit this URL and click on these buttons and enter these forms but instead of us having to do that capybara will do that for us so it's really nice um, capybara also has integration with um, you know mini test as well as test unit and uh, a number of those of other testing frameworks but um, I'm most comfortable with RSpec and capybara so yes, RSpec is a testing framework, and Capybara is a browser simulation tool. It's also a uh, water-dwelling-based mammal, I believe. I, I don't know. It's open source, so they could name it whatever they want. So here's an example of a RSpec spec that is going to actually be testing using a um, using a new account. So we're going to start off using the visit keyword. So visit in Capybara means go to this URL. And then we can use code from our code from within Rails. So here we, we have the new user registration path. This application happens to use device. So the u, new user registration path is, is where you go to sign up as a user. And um, once the browser has rendered that, once they are on that page, then we just simply say, we want to fill in, we're going to find a field that is labeled uh, user underscore email. And we're going to fill it in with, the user attributes of email. And I, we got these attributes using a, another open source tool called um, Factory Girl. You don't necessarily have to do that. You could just put in your own email, but uh, you do, you want to make sure that um, if 
you have some sort of validations on these types of things that they all pass. Um, you know, if you're if you're looking for unique or uh, repeatable emails that uh, you don't want to have any kind of conflicts. So once we fill in the user email, we go to the next step, and then we fill in the user password. Again, we are using um, user attributes and the password from that. You could just put in your own password. And then finally, we tell Capybara to click on the item called user underscore submit. This is going to be the submit button. Once it's done that, then we just want to simply verify that you weren't redirected back to the same page. If there's a problem submitting your account, then you are going to be back on the same page. But if it if it went through, you're going to be on another page. Of course, this is kind of a simplified test. We could also uh, we could also check for different elements inside of that page. We could assert the what page it's actually supposed to be on. Um, you know, I find the um, the less restrictive my assertions are, generally the better my tests are. If you make them too restrictive, then you're going to get a bunch of false positives. And if every single time you change any piece of your code, your if your tests fail, you know then that is a sign of too much crypt, uh, too much coupling. You don't want that to happen. So anyway, this is this is just an example of one way that we can just use Capybara to simulate. And, well, Capybara and RSpec to simulate the way you would do manual testing, but instead you're doing automated testing. All right, so I could talk about testing for 40 straight hours. Um, it is, once you have gotten into it, it is fantastic. Um, it will save you time, it will save you headaches, uh, but it is, it is not a cure-all. It uh, Some people, whenever they hear about testing, you have two, mostly two different groups. Some say, well, you know, that sounds, uh, you know, it sounds like I'm writing everything twice. And you're not really. Um, you're just verifying that the things you wrote work the way you think they should. Uh, you're telling the computer how you think they should. And then you, you have another group, was, which is like, man, wow, I really see the value in that. I'm going to just like test everything like 30 times. And, you know, I'm going to test user sign in with like a good email and I'm going to test user sign in with a bad email. And I'm going to, uh, you know, test uh, user sign in with or sign up with a uh, duplicate email and like password not short enough and short enough. And then at the end of the day, you look back and you're like, oh, wow, you know, I've got a hundred tests for this, this one, one little small part of my app. And, you know, you look back and there's a thousand tests total and then you run that and it, and it takes forever. And, you know, one thing, if one thing breaks or one, one test fails and a hundred tests fail, then that's not, that's not really all that helpful. So it, it does take a little bit of a balancing act. Um, their tests are incredibly, incredibly valuable. Um, but as I mentioned, you know, I could spend much more time and we do have to keep on going. Uh, in general, I try to stay away from testing zealots and I just say test with uh, whatever feels comfortable to you and your team and whatever makes sense to you and your team. Um, uh, I recommend personally using RSpec or Minitest for frameworks, and I recommend using uh, doing integration testing with Capybara. It, as I mentioned, it makes at least as as a beginner, it made the most sense to me because it's how I was actually manually testing. It's you're almost replacing manual testing with automated testing, so it, it makes sense. Um, of course, there is definitely a time and place for those other ones we talked about: unit testing, functional testing. Um, but uh, writing just one integration test will cover quite a few of those scenarios. So if you are going to start with anything, or even if you're going to only write one type of test, I would recommend uh, using Capybara and integration tests. Um, so yeah, it's close to how you actually test manually. In general, you want to test, run your tests as you're developing, of course, but also uh, before you deploy to production. So if you always run, if all, you always test the important features, and you always run your test before you push to production, then you know that after you have pushed to production, things should work. Kind of seems to make sense. We're, again, we're after those preventable disasters. And if you, if you get an error, if you get this unexplained thing in your application, then you want to fix it, of course, but you should also maybe write a test for it so that it doesn't happen again. And you, you won't always be able to do that, but eh, sometimes you can. And it's really nice to know, and, and you you commit the fix, and then 
you can actually say to the team, hey, this is what happened, and you know, this is why it will never happen again, because you know, we added the, these tests. Um, again, you don't want to be bloated with your testing, but you do want to cover your critical cases. So that's all I have to say for today about testing. Um, by popular request, next up, we're going to be talking about uh, pulling out data from a spreadsheet and putting it to into your database. So stay tuned. <laughs>